Good morning, and welcome to this worship service with the Congregation of St. Matthew's United Methodist Church. My name is Mark Schaefer. I'm the senior pastor at St. Matthew's, and it's my privilege to welcome you to worship with us this morning. This morning is our reconciling Sunday service. That is, we are celebrating our commitment to having become a reconciling congregation earlier this year. Reconciling is a United Methodist term that means a community that is committed to inclusion for all persons, especially to be vocal about inclusion for persons of lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and other identities. Today, we celebrate that commitment through a special service in which we reflect on what that means and in which we hear the experiences of those for whom such a statement can be so powerful. So I'm grateful to our social justice committee and to the subcommittee uh, working on LGBTQ plus issues uh, for their enthusiasm, for their planning this service, and for the energy that they have brought into making this important witness. And so wherever you have come from, whatever you believe or doubt, whether this is your first day on a journey of faith or your 5,000th, whomever you love, you are welcome here with us this morning. I invite you now to join in the call to worship, uh, which can be found in the worship materials accessible via link uh, following alongside the live stream as we join reading responsibly together. Gather us in, O God, we who are a grand spectrum of your children, Prisons that catch your light with furtive wanting and give it back in a variety of blended hues. Gather us in, O God, as dancing colors of a rainbow in the sky. For our very being is the fulfillment of your promise. Our first hymn this morning is number 548, In Christ There Is No East or West. Join with me in reading the opening prayer. Gracious God, one in three, whose Trinitarian nature reveals you to be deeply relational, deliver us from our false independence, connect us with the whole of creation, draw us closer to you through our relationships with one another, so that we know the suffering of others as our own, knowing you as mother, Father, beloved, and friend, we pray all these things to you. Amen.
a couple of announcements. As mentioned, today is our Reconciling Sunday. It is a Sunday in our Other Six Days program in which we seek to integrate what we talk about in worship with what we live out in Christian worship. Our Social Justice Committee has identified four issues to explore in great depth this year, uh, race and poverty, environment, and LGBTQ plus issues. And today is the Sunday in which in our worship, we reflect on LGBTQ issues and on the need for inclusion. Other aspects of the other six days include educational pieces, which you will see uh, coming in uh, the, the circuit rider and in other outlets like that, um, in book studies and so on, as well as service and action opportunities. So keep your eyes peeled for those events as we move forward. Next Sunday is uh, the Interfaith Thanksgiving service. Uh, some of you have been asking about that. It will obviously not be in person this year. It will be online uh, via Zoom and via live stream. That will be next Thursday, Sunday, the 22nd at 7 p.m. Um, stay tuned for more detailed information as to what the links for that will be um, and what those um, opportunities will be. But you can join in um, in that inter interfaith time of Thanksgiving and reflecting on thankfulness. As um, are, Before I get to that, are there any other announcements that need to be lifted up? Okay, so Sunday school today at 11.30, and youth group Zoom at 5 um, this afternoon. Any other announcements that need to be lifted up? Speaking of 5 p.m., uh, at 5 p.m. today, under direction from the governor's office and from state authorities, uh, we are re-entering a heightened state of COVID protectiveness. Uh, what that means is that gatherings of certain sizes will be prohibited going forward Indoor gatherings larger than 10 will not be allowed starting at 5 p.m. today. Uh, this is in response to the rising number of cases, both nationally and in our region, um, and uh, the number, an, an attempt to try to stave off this e expansion of infection that is now taking place with some close to 200,000 cases a day at this point. So um, this has implications for our plans on re-entry and are looking at that. Our reentry task force is about to reach out with some updated information reflecting the poll. That information may already now be dated um, given this. So I ask you to bear with that as they reach out and as we reflect on that and take the advice into the direction of our governmental authorities. Are there any other announcements that need to be lifted up? If not, then let us continue in our worship with our prayer of confession. Let us pray. O oh, gracious and loving God, who calls us to be your people in this age, forgive us when we keep Christ in the past and the gospel as letters on a page and the church as an organization in which we may or may not participate. Forgive us when fellowship and mission is meant for and delivered to those we already know and love and we become a social club instead of your church. Forgive us and have mercy upon us, O God. Let your risen Christ reside here with us, and the gospel be the power of our life, and the church be a people and place, showing your love wherever we may be. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hear the good news that Christ died for us while we were still sinners. That proves God's love for us. And so in the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. And as a forgiven and a reconciled people, let us share in signs of Christ's peace with one another by turning to those seated next to you or by entering words of peace and greeting in the comments of our live stream. Peace be with you. And now we come to the time for joys and concerns. Uh, we are asking prayers for Abby Dunn's cousin's daughter, Lisa. She had surgery and then had to be lifted to Presbyterian Hospital in Pittsburgh and is in ICU. So please have um, prayers for Lisa. I'm also asking prayers for Tammy Jones, my friend. Um, she is still having some issues and is going tomorrow for another test. 
to see if they can diagnose what is going on. Um, and for a joy, Mary Jennings celebrated a birthday last week. So happy birthday again, Mary. Thank you. Let us be in an attitude of prayer. Gracious God, we gather this day to celebrate being a reconciling congregation, reflecting the love and the reconciliation that you have inaugurated with us through Jesus. For we know that we can look at the world and see it as a broken place, a place alienated from you, a place longing for redemption. We look into ourselves and see ourselves as broken, hurting, and yet we know that you have already reconciled us to you. That you have already inaugurated the restoration and reconciliation of the world. And it is in that light, in that hope, that we can pray to you for those who are in need. That we can pray to you out of our brokenness, for our brokenness. We remember this day, O oh Lord, all those who are sick, all those in need of medical care, all those in need of healing of the body. We lift up especially Lisa and Tammy and all those who are struggling for physical wholeness. We pray for the many thousands afflicted with COVID, for those facing terminal illnesses, for those facing chronic illnesses. And we pray for their healing. We pray, O oh God, that they might have access to the resources they need, that they might be treated by practitioners whose hands are guided with compassion and skill, that we as a people might do what is necessary to help those practitioners not be overwhelmed that we might take responsibility to ensure that medical care can be delivered to those in need. That we might offer resource, that we might provide loving community to aid in recovery and renewal. We pray too for those who experience the brokenness of heart or mind or spirit, those who struggle with anxiety and depression, those who struggle with loneliness and isolation, those who struggle with other mental illnesses and mental difficulties, and those whose struggles have been exacerbated by the lockdown, by the pandemic, by the social isolation. Lord, we pray here too that those so afflicted might have access to resource that is helpful and healing, that practitioners here too are guided with compassion and skill, that resource be made available, that we might be supporting a loving community. We pray for all those experience the brokenness of relationship, friendships strained, family relationships torn asunder. And on this day, we think especially of those family members who are estranged from one another, having been rejected, cast out, because of whom they love, because of whom they feel themselves and understand themselves to be. Lord, we pray for reconciliation. We pray for healing in these broken relationships. We pray that where they can be repaired, they be repaired where they best be let go, they are able to be let go with peace and healing. We pray too for the reconciliation of relationship in our broader communities, in a nation still very much riven with political and ideological differences, with rising tribalism and recrimination. We pray for a sense of being able to see one another as children of God. 
We pray for communities afflicted with brokenness, the brokenness of racism, of economic injustice, of poverty, of systemic oppression. We pray for those living under authoritarian rule, for those struggling for freedom, for those who are persecuted, for those who are marginalized, for a world still very much under the grip of war and violence, hate and suffering. In the midst of all this brokenness, O oh Lord, it might seem futile to ask for help. But we have seen your reconciliation already at work. We have seen it in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, who brought healing unto the sick, comfort to the afflicted, who cast out the demons of those who were troubled within, who brought people into fellowship who had been excluded, who built relationships built on common love of one another and love of you, who spoke out against injustice, who was killed at the hands of unjust rule, and yet who was raised to new life, that we might know that hate does not have the final word, that injustice does not have the final word, that oppression, that principalities and powers do not have the final word, but you do. Love does, life does. And so we are able to pray all these things to you in his name. And we do so using the words that while he was yet with us, he taught us to pray saying, our father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We continue in our worship with hymn number 549, Where Charity and Love Prevail.
This morning's reading is from the Hebrew scriptures in Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 9. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. Keep these words that I am commanding to you today in your heart. Recite them to your children and talk about them when you are at home and when you are away, when you lie down and when you rise. Find them as a sign on your hand, fix them as an emblem on your forehead, and write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please join with me in the congregational response, Psalm 133. How very good and pleasant it is when kindred live together in unity. It is like the precious oils on the head running down upon the beard, on the beard of Aaron, running down over the collar of his robes. It is like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord ordained his blessing, life forevermore. This morning's epistle reading is from the first letter of John, 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 21. Beloved, let us love one another, because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the anointing sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, since God loved us so much, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God lives in us and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us, because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and do testify that the Father has sent his Son as the Savior of the world. God abides in those who confess that Jesus is the Son of God, and that they abide in God, so that we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love, and those who abide in love abide in God, and God abides in them. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness on the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in the world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not reached perfection in love. We love because he first loved, loved us. Those who say, I love God, and hate their brothers or sisters are liars. For those who do not love a brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. The commandment that we have from him is this, those who love God must love their brothers and sisters also. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. reading is from the gospel according to John. John chapter 13 verse 34 through 35. Jesus said, 
I give you a new commandment, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I'm so glad you could join us today. Our message this morning, our children's message, is very simple. In the gospel we read today, it said, I give you a new commandment, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. That's pretty simple, isn't it? Well, it's kind of hard for some people. Do you think God loves you more if you have brown hair or blue hair? I do like blue hair, though. <laughs> No, he loves everyone the same. It doesn't matter the color of your skin or who you love or what you do. He loves you. And that's something we need to always remember, that God loves us and he wants us to love others. Let us pray. Dear God, thank you for loving us. Help us to love one another. Amen. I'd like to say a brief word of introduction for the speakers we're going to hear in just a couple minutes. We're going to be hearing from Lauren Bond and Jackie Gerard. Lauren is known to this congregation, having grown up in Bowie and attending St. Matthew's as a child. She now resides in Colorado, where she leads wilderness rites of passage and canoe outings with her organization, The River's Path. Um, she encourages you to explore that organization's website, which is theriverspath.org. And if you want to reach out to her following the service, you can do so at lauren at theriverspath.org. Our second speaker is Jackie Gerard. Jackie was born in Pennsylvania, moved to the Bowie area sometime in the early 90s, and has been an active member 
including serving as our current chair of the Board of Trustees here at St. Matthew's since 1994. We are both grateful for their willingness to share their testimony, to share their experience, and to bring the word this morning. I haven't looked out over this, well, empty congregation and all of it in a really long time. But I feel really good to be able to be a part of this service. The commandment we have from him is this, that those who lo love God must love their brothers and sisters also. And for me, this is the key to being an ally. If I don't understand someone or I meet someone who's different than I am, I tried to get to know that person and understand who they are and what they care about. Hate comes from ignorance, from not knowing. Once you truly know a person, compassion and love are inevitable. Growing up, my best friend was the first person to come out as gay in my high school. He was outgoing and deeply loved by everyone who knew him. He still is. I had a huge crush on him and was profoundly disappointed that my love for him would never be reciprocated. Instead, we became even closer friends. At parties, all of us would sit around and ask him all sorts of questions, and we hung on every word he said. Some were profound, deep, emotional questions, and some were about the practicalities of where he met people to go out with since no one else at our school was out as gay. I told my parents everything. I educated them as my friend educated me. When I learned that he was attacked and badly beaten in the boys' bathroom at my school, I came home sobbing to my mom. When I found out that a man that he went on a date with in high school was violent with him, the anger I felt toward this shadowy figure that I will never know the identity of has been unparalleled by any feeling in my life. There's a reason this friend never told me their names. My mom loves this friend as much as I do, and I believe that he is the reason that she's joined the effort to, join, to support the LGBTQ community here at St. Matthew's. His parents never fully accepted his sexual orientation. They called his life partner his roommate, this was incredibly hurtful to him. They never accepted him fully, even on their respective deathbeds. If there's one thing that I could change for him, it is this. I wish his parents had accepted him fully and been willing to meet his partner, who he's been with for nearly 15 years. If there's one thing that I could change for everyone who, ex who identifies as LGBTQIA+, I wish that their parents, church, and community could accept them and love them as they are, as I imagined that Jesus would love and accept them for who they are. Another more recent example, I have two friends who are genderqueer, and they use the pronouns they, them, and theirs. I asked questions because I'd never met someone who didn't identify as male or female. I remembered what it was like for me as a child. A tomboy who loved climbing trees, playing with Hot Wheels and building with blocks. I remember distinctly wishing I was a boy because I had more in common with boys I knew than with girls. I remember what it was like to not be able to play hockey when I was 13 because there were no girls hockey teams. I was made fun of so badly for my skinny legs as a child that I never wore dresses and I hid my body under clothes much larger than my size in hopes that no one would notice or comment on my tiny body. I was picked on so badly by girls at school that I imagined if I were a boy, my life would be easier. But that was different than not identifying as a girl. I never felt like I was in the wrong body. I never felt uncomfortable when someone said she, referring to me. I never had anyone mistakenly identify me as a gender that I didn't identify myself as. In the time that these two friends and I guided canoeing trips together, they were called he at least as often as they were called she. 
Occasionally, someone would, ask me, someone would ask me if they were boys or girls. I would share that they were genderqueer and didn't identify as men or women, and I requested that they use they, them, and theirs pronouns. The people who usually asked, you know, they tried to use the pronouns that they preferred. No one was overtly hostile with them, which was a relief for me. However, they did experience microaggressions that I didn't pick up on. People stared, they peered at them, trying to figure out what they were, what gender they were, and really maybe what kind of creature they might be. I didn't see it even though I was right there. They got stares that made them feel like they weren't regarded as human. I tokenized them unintentionally, feeling good about myself for having my very first employees being genderqueer and one being a person of color. I patted myself for, on the back for being so open and being able to use the river's path as a place to educate about inclusivity. I hurt them unintentionally by pointing out how great my business was because I had hired the two of them. I didn't realize how challenging it was for them when someone on a trip was clearly from a community that was not as inclusive. At times, they felt afraid for their safety while working with me, and I never realized it. At times, they felt hurt by my ignorance, and I didn't realize it. I wasn't perfect, but I've tried to learn so I can constantly be a better ally. I did ask questions. I read articles, I watched videos, I practiced using they, them, and theirs pronouns until it became habit. I advocated for inclusion, and I asked how I could support their efforts. We took groups of LGBT folks on the river, and I shared events they were leading with my community even when they were no longer working with me. I went with them to the bathroom and to changing rooms and shielded them from any stairs with my own body. I listened and I learned and I did my best to experience what life would be like in their shoes. And I'm speaking here today. It shouldn't be the expected responsibility for anyone to speak on the behalf of their entire community. No one should be singled out. Hey you, you're gay, right? What do gay people feel about this issue? This happened all the time to my friends. Every friend I know who is part of a marginalized community, whether it's the LGBTQ community or people of color or whatever, they get singled out if they're the only one in the room and they say, hey you, what do black people feel about this? What do gay people feel about this? That's not okay. You have to get to know people individually. It's essential. You have to ask people, what do you feel? How does this impact you? It doesn't feel good to be singled out unwillingly. Sure, there are spokespeople that thrive in a setting where they're the representative, the educator, but we as cisgender, heterosexual people should not put people on the spot unless they are willing. That's really important in being an ally. I'm stepping back now and examining how I can be a better ally. I think this is what we all must do. I aim to be curious and open and accepting of everyone who is not like me. I aim to find common ground and find love for everyone in the world, especially for people who are different than me. I commit to being a voice for inclusion and allyship and taking every opportunity I can to make this world a better place where everyone is truly accepted and treated as equals. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Jackie Gerard and I've been a member of the St. Matthews family since 1994. We've laughed together, we've cried together, we've eaten together many times, and we've prayed together. I've worked with many of you over the years as a member of the following teams. 
been in choir since 1994, Spirit Move since 1995, on the Finance Committee Forever, the Endowment Fund Committee, the Ad Board and Ad Council, the Reentry Safely Team, the Nominations and Development Team, the LGBTQIA plus team of the Justice Team, the Theater Troupe since 1996, the Stewardship Team twice, SPPRC twice, and I've been the Chair of Trustees six of the last nine years. Oh yes, and I'm gay. I know this shocks some of you, and others are fine with it. When Pat and I joined St. Matthew's in 1994, we were just short of our 20th anniversary. So see, nothing has changed about me. In October 2020, we celebrated our 46th anniversary. Lots of things have changed in 46 years. Admitting to being in a homosexual relationship could mean losing your job, your career, your friendships, your family, and your church. So better not to mention it. We've gone through years not mentioning it and playing parts, but that's all ended now. When you met the person you plan to spend your life with, you told friends, family, anyone who would listen. Then you met your soon-to-be in-laws. You planned your wedding, had your parties. You went to your church and had your minister perform the ceremony that was meant to start your lives together till death do you part. None of that happened for us until our 40th anniversary. Then we were allowed to get married, but not in the church. We got married at home and had folks from the church, the army, guiding eyes, anyone who would come. And we had a wonderful, wonderful party. It was indeed worth the wait. Late last year, Daniel and Chelsea started to offer classes on the Reconciling Ministry Network, explaining the history of the movement and how we could join. There was plenty of vigorous discussion at these sessions. A reconciling team was set up and worked on a mission statement that would proclaim our church a welcoming place for all God's children. It reads, St. Matthew's UMC is an inclusive church connected to our community and committed to welcoming all persons in every phase of church life. We choose to live by Christ's example, affirming that all people are created in the image of God. We celebrate our diversity of sexual orientation, gender identity, race, age, marital status, nationality, physical abilities, mental abilities, and economic position. Through the Spirit, we commit to live by the words of John Wesley, to love alike, though we may not always think alike. In February 2020, BC, before COVID, we as a congregation came together to vote on whether or not we would become a reconciling combination congregation. People from the 8.30 service stayed. People from the 11 o'clock service came early. We had 215 people vote that day. When it was all tabulated, 88% of those present voted for the proposal. If you remember anything from my speaking to you today, take this thought with you. Love is only possible because God has given it to each of us. We cannot make ourselves love another person. It happens. God controls it. 
The expression falling in love probably describes what happens best. Falling is nothing any of us can control, and neither is love. Thank you.
Gracious and loving God, we give thanks to you for these gifts. Grant that they may be dedicated to your service, that we as your people may continue to build communities of inclusion, that we may continue to create a space for everyone born, that we may continue to draw the circle wide. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 2283, In the Faith We Sing, In the Midst of New Dimensions.
There is an old Shaker hymn built on the words of 1 John. If ye love not each other in daily communion, how can ye love God whom ye have not seen? God has called us to share in the love with God, which God has so freely given to us, to love those whom we see, to love those in our lives, to love the marginalized, the estranged, the hopeless, to expand the all-inclusive love of God into the corners it has not yet reached. And so we go into the world to bring that love. And as we go, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the community of the Holy Spirit go with us now and always.